Well, if you got your Bibles, I invite you to turn to 2 Timothy. I'll meet you there in a minute. But before we get to that, let me just say, Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. It's a great day to be alive, a great day to honor moms. Um, uh, we don't do this uh, really ever at our church, like singling out people, and especially singling out women for their age. But uh, there's a godly woman mother, a grandmother, uh, here um, that I just want to honor. The first service, we had one uh, mother over 90. I think the second service, we have one mother over 90. She just became 90. Martha Grove here. Happy Mother's Day to you. And um, I don't know if you want this, but this you're one of the oldest women in our congregation. So praise God for that. And she still serves. So if you don't serve and you're 50 years younger than you, I'm just saying, she still serves. And uh, she uh, gives and supports. And um, get, our student ministry is blessed by her baking and cooking and goodies. And so awesome. Happy birthday. Happy Mother's Day uh, to you. When I was a young pastor, I, I didn't really preach on Mother's Day about mothers, Father's Day about fathers. I said, those are societal holidays. I'm not going to follow that. I just would preach whatever we're, passage we're in. I don't care if we're in Judges and we're uh, Ehud killing King Eglon by shoving a sword in his fat stomach and not trying to be able to get it out. I'd preach that. Um, but uh, you know what? Then my wife uh, became mother of our three kids. My two grandmothers went to heaven, and uh, now this Mother's Day, I'm going to talk a little bit about mothers, okay? And uh, so we want to honor our mothers. But I'm just going to do it by looking at an interesting text this morning, a couple different passages in 2 Timothy. And uh, here's the big idea this morning, this message. A godly woman leaves a lasting legacy, specifically a godly mother. You don't need to be a mother to leave a legacy of faith. You don't. Um, you don't have to be a woman uh, to leave a legacy of faith. You, don't, you can be a man. This message is for everybody. Although we're going to be talking specifically about Christian uh, mothers, this is for you if you're not a mother. Maybe you've wanted to be a mother. You hope to be a mother, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, maybe uh, you have dreams of a family and they haven't come true yet. Maybe you're a guy that's single and you're wondering if there's somebody out there for you. All of those things can be true. You can pray for all of those things, but no matter what your station of life, you can have a difference, make a difference for God in this life. You can leave a lasting legacy. You don't have to be a mother to do this, but we are going to talk a little bit about being a godly mother and uh, passing on the legacy of faith. And uh, there it is, yes. So we don't just grab the Bible, tear it open, and just start reading where we're at. We want to know a little bit of the context about it, right? We always say that here at Village Bible Church. So let me give you a little context of 2 Timothy. It's a letter that's written from the Apostle Paul to his son in the faith. That's what he calls him. My true child in the faith, he calls him in 1 Timothy. And so Paul writes to his son in the faith, his protege in the faith, to give him some final instructions before Paul actually ends up dying. And, and so this is like his last writings that we have from the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul met Timothy in uh, Lystra. And uh, Paul went on his first missionary journey. He planted all these churches. He started churches and all throughout what we would call uh, modern-day Turkey. And then for his second missionary journey, he went back to those towns, went back to those churches that he started to encourage them, to see how they were doing, to, to check up on them. And when he came back to this uh, town in Lystra, he, uh, that's going to that's gonna really throw me off. We just might have to call the whole day off and just celebrate moms today. But are you guys okay if it goes on and off? Maybe just leave it off if it's that. That's fine. Um, so Paul is uh, with Timothy somewhere in uh, east of here. Um, and he, uh, he is, uh, I'm struggling. I'm really struggling. <laughs> So, so let me just go to Acts 16. This will help. Always go to the Word of God if you've got a question. So Acts chapter 16, the Apostle Paul is coming back uh, to this town uh, where he planted this church to see how they're doing, to encourage the believers, and he gets there and he finds this young man named Timothy. Acts chapter 16, verse 1. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. 
And as they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. So the apostle Paul, remember last week, the church was under this controversy that there were some Christians who were Jews who said you had to keep the Old Testament law. You had Jesus, but you needed circumcision. You had Jesus, but you needed to follow the dietary laws if you really wanted to be part of the people of God. And remember, the Apostle Paul said, no, 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 you're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God. Don't put this burden of the, of the Old Testament law on Gentile believers. And then he actually got face to face with Peter because Peter initially had said the same thing, but then when he was feeling all the pressure from these Jewish Christians, he, he kind of shrunk back. He got scared. And Paul like, got in his face, Galatians chapter 2, and said, what are you doing? We know it's Jesus plus nothing. Don't put this burden on, on the Gentiles. And then in Acts chapter 15, they make a decision to that very end that we're not going to require um, Gentile Christians to take on the weight of the law, to, to keep the law. And so Paul recruits Timothy to come with him to take this message that was reached in Acts 15 to all of the churches. The apostles had made a decision. If you're a Gentile believer, you don't have to follow the Old Testament law. And so, Timothy, come along with me. I know your mom's a Christian Jew. Your dad's a Gentile. You're not circumcised because your dad's a Gentile. So we're going to circumcise you before we go to the churches. Now, what in the world is going on? You're bringing a message that the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, that they don't have to follow the Old Testament law. But now you're having your Timothy be circumcised as you go to the churches to bring him the message. Remember last week when we were talking about Peter shrinking back, the, the point there was um, don't fear what other people think of you. Fear God. Peter got scared. What are these Christians thinking? That I'm not as good of a Christian? Uh, I'm, I'm going to be scared about what people think of me. The application was don't fear people, fear God. But, but the message on, on this the initial application is this, is that sometimes we do things or we don't do things for the sake of the faith of another person, even though we might have the freedom to do it. You see, Timothy didn't need to be circumcised. It wasn't God's law to do that, but uh, Paul had him circumcised so that he wouldn't give any of the other people in the church an area which they could dispute him. And in the same way, um, you as a Christian have um, freedom to bring a bottle of wine to the park and, and hang out with your wife and have a picnic. And, um, but if somebody's going to be at that picnic who's struggling with their faith and maybe has struggled with alcohol, even though you have the freedom to do that, you're not going to do it. Why? Because that's the law? No. It's because you give up some things for the sake of the gospel to minister to the people. Are you with me? And, and in the same way, that's what the Apostle Paul does with Timothy. And Timothy gives up his rights to not be circumcised so that they can go church to church with this message and nobody can raise an accusation against them. So sometimes we give up some of our rights for the sake of the people that we love and that we care for. My grandmother, um, who's been in heaven since 2018, she was 100 when she uh, got there. Um, one year I brought her back from here to her home in Des Moines. She was visiting our family here and I drove her back and I was kind of proud to do that and she sat in the back seat of a little uh, Pontiac Grand Prix that I had and I um, am ashamed of this but I listened on the way back to Des Moines to um, Christian hard rock music, okay? And uh, yes, that exists. Don't ever listen to it. But um, I was listening to it and, and I, I liked it, and I thought it sounded good. Grandma didn't say anything. I thought it was fine. We, we had conversations. So I wasn't just blasting it. But then after I dropped her off, I went, had the music on. I got in the back seat for something, and I sat there, and I was like, this is really loud back here. Like, man, Grandma had to go through listening to this the whole way home with her grandson. I felt so bad from that. Grandma was hard of hearing from that day on, too. She got it back. She got it back in heaven, so that's good. But no, she, uh, but she went through that. So I should have, I should have given up some of my freedom to listen to some good Christian music. Um, I could have given that up for the sake of the love that I had for my grandmother, and I really should have done that. And I really do regret that I, that I did that. In the same way, for the people that we love, 
the people in our family, the people in our lives, our friends and our neighbors. There are some things that we do even though we don't have to do them because we love them. There's some things we restrain ourselves from even though we have the freedom to participate in them. We don't because we're trying to reach them with the love of Jesus Christ. Timothy is Paul's protege, does this very thing, and he goes, blesses the churches, and then the apostle Paul leaves him in Ephesus as the chief pastor or elder at the church in Ephesus. So Timothy is ministering at this church, and he gets these letters from Paul. Paul's nearing the end of his life. Paul is writing to Timothy to encourage him to keep on, to protect his church, the flock that God has given him. And Paul is nearing the end of his life. These are the last prison letters that we have from Paul. And he says this in chapter 4. If you've got your Bibles now, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul's at the end of his race. He's about ready to lose his head, literally, for the sake of Christ. And these are his last words that he writes to Timothy to encourage him. And I pray that it would be an encouragement to you. We'll start here. Number one, a godly mother leaves a legacy of faith with her family. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. A godly mother leaves a legacy of faith with her family. A legacy is the long-lasting impact of a particular event or some action that had taken place in a person's life that gets passed on. That's what a legacy is. Something that happens to you that makes such an impact that it's going to be passed on to other people. The event being passed down here in chapter 1 that's being described by the Apostle Paul is the faith that his grandmother and mother had. The faith that they had in Jesus Christ. And and we don't know if his grandmother Lois was a contemporary of Jesus. It would take her back to the days of Christ. Did she see Jesus? Did she see the risen Savior? We don't know. But she came to a point in her life where she trusted in Jesus Christ that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, sent to save his people from their sins. And she realized that all the Old Testament sacrifices, the lambs being sacrificed for the sins of the people, were, were about Jesus. It pointed to Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah now. And Jesus died, and he rose again. And this has changed my life, and it will change my life forever. And that legacy of faith was passed on then to Timothy's mother, Eunice. By the way, if your name is Lois or Eunice, uh, be a proud bearer of that name, those names, because those are, those are names that have a legacy of faith. So a godly mother, not a perfect mother because there's no such thing, but a godly mother passes on her faith to her family. And I want you to hear this, moms, all of you, that there's no such thing as a perfect mother, that you've got to look a certain way, that you've got to wear certain clothes, that you've you got to speak a certain way, that you've got to hold yourself and carry yourself in a certain way, that you've got to do specific duties in the house, that you've got to... No, no, we're not describing an idealistic mother, whatever that looks like. We're talking about a godly woman who is a mother who serves her family well by passing on her faith, imperfect though she is. In 2019, right before COVID, a study came out from the Barna Group. It said that most practicing Christians in the U.S. today came to faith because of the influence of a believer in their household. Of those, 68% said that it was a mother's faith that influenced them. Just under half indicated that it was the father's faith, and 37% said a grandparent's faith helped persuade them to become a Christian. Some of you are grandparents now. You're um, not on the scene like you once were when you had your kids in your home, but you still have a role to play. 37% of those Christians who became Christians were impacted by the faith of their grandparents. All of that to say that most Christians... 
We can say this statistically. Most professing, professing Christians are Christians because of the home that they were raised in. Now, we know that it's God at work. He's the one doing the saving. But isn't it curious that most believers come from a home that has a legacy of faith? It was the same for Timothy. So here's a question, because maybe you're thinking this. What does a family that is faith-filled look like? A woman wrote to... Um, focus on the family, and she asked this. She said, can you help me understand what it means to build a family life that is truly founded upon Christian values? My spouse is always looking or talking about the importance of having a Christ-centered home, but I don't really know what that means. I grew up in a family where people's actions rarely match their religious words, and I don't want to repeat that pattern. Any ideas? Well, I'm with her on that. I don't want to have a home that can say the right words at the right times, but they don't have a changed heart. So what does it mean to have a home that honors Jesus Christ, that passes on the legacy of faith? Let me give you two big things. It's not in the notes, but jot these down. The first thing is this. A Christian home is God-centered. A Christian home is God-centered. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses, God through Moses, is sharing with the people of God what this home looks like. He says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. God-centered home that you're always talking about the Lord. And let me give you three different areas underneath this God-centered heading. The first one is this, to talk about him all the time, to talk about God all the time. That's the point of the Deuteronomy passage. Um, When you wake up in the morning, you're talking about the Lord. When you go to bed at night, you're talking about the Lord. When you come to the breakfast table, you're talking about the Lord. When you go to school, on the way there, you're talking about the Lord. When you get picked up from school, on the way home, you're talking about the Lord. The Lord is central to your home, God-centered home. So you talk about God all the time. The second thing of a God-centered home is that you talk to God all the time. So not only are you talking about him and what he's done and who he is, but then you're talking to him in prayer. And you're praying before each meal, not because you have to. It's not a legalistic thing, but you're doing it, and we do it in our house as a pattern to help remind us that this good thing that we have to eat, sometimes better than others, but it's Mother's Day, the great thing that you have before you to eat that day, we give thanks to God for that good thing because we're always talking to God in our daily life. So we talk about God, we talk to God, and then the third thing is we talk with others about God. In worship, that's what it means to have a God-centered home. It's what you're doing right now. You're gathering with a community of believers, and you're worshiping, and you're studying God's word, and you're singing God's praise, and hopefully you're getting to know the people around you, and, and, and you're friends with people around you, and they're not just church friends, but they're real friends, and they're encouraging you, and they're helping you, and you're helping them, and you're serving with them, and you're growing with them, and you're doing life together with them, and you're talking to other people about their relationship with the Lord, and you're growing in your faith with a community of people here at Village Bible Church. That's what it means to have a God-centered home, that you talk about God, you talk to God, and you talk with others about God. Secondly, second big heading is not only you're God-centered, a Christian home bears the fruit of the Spirit. A Christian home bears the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, we read what the fruit of the Spirit is. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. This is verse 22 and 23 of Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. This is a list of values of a Christian, and they're to be the values of a Christian home. That it's a home of love and forgiveness, of peace. Love carries no record of wrongs, so... Husbands, wives are not bringing up past sins of the husbands and wife when somebody steps out of line. Remember when you did this, or I'm going to hold on to this, and I'm going to be resentful about this. No, you have a loving home. Your kid comes home and they've screwed up royally. 
There's discipline in that home. There's order in that home. But there's love in that home. There's forgiveness in that home. There's restoration in that home as you practice the fruit of the Spirit in your lives. All of us, kids, young people, husbands, wives, grandparents, bearing the fruit of the Spirit. To sum it up, Jesus, when he was asked what are the two greatest commandments in Matthew chapter 22, he said this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Those two things should be in our home, that we would love God and that we would love each other. That's what a Christian home looks like. A godly mother leaves a legacy of faith with her family. Secondly, a godly mother passes on this legacy in the lives of her little ones. This happened to Timothy when he was little, tiny Tim. He was given this legacy of faith. It was passed on to him. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Look at the text. Whom, the word whom there is a plural in the Greek. Your Bible might even have a note there. Um, it, it means that there's a, a plurality of people who taught Timothy. So that is to say, raising kids to know the Lord is a team job. It's a team duty. Amen? By the way, that was a great spot for a husband to say amen. Raising kids is a team sport. Amen. It's not just the mom doing the work. Maybe just the diapers, but not the rest of the work. And, uh, and, and it's a team sport, and it's grandparents, and, and uh, it takes a lot of work. It's a hard job. And so he says to Timothy, you know from whom, plural, what you've learned and believed, verse 15, and how from childhood you have become acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ. So the way in which they did it is that they taught the scriptures to little Timmy. Ever since he was little, he learned about Jesus. And now this happens, and I don't want to discourage you if your kids aren't little anymore. My kids are growing up fast. Our youngest is into high school this year, almost done with their first year of high school. So we're kind of past, we've passed the little kid stage. And, um, and there's always hope for any of our kids, no matter what their age. God loves our kids more than we love them. And Henry teaches a class uh, that is focused on ministering to our older children. And, and so we believe God can work through our older children, absolutely. But here specifically, uh, Timothy's childhood is mentioned and how uh, Lois and Eunice instructed him in the scriptures when they were little, when he was little. And how appropriate is this? Because I don't know if you've noticed this. As you look around our church, we have lots of families with lots of little kids. We do. And that's a great place to be. And so mom, dad, pass on this legacy of faith into the lives of your little ones. And so here's just a little personal word uh, to the parents. Uh, make the most of each day that you have with your little ones. I'm pretty nostalgic and probably too nostalgic. But I look back when my kids were little, and those are some beautiful times. And praying with our kids, tucking your kids in at night, ask, asking them if they have any questions to talk about, talking about the Lord, what he's done for us, talking about our future in heaven that is coming, the new heavens and the new earth, when Jesus Christ returns, talking about the promises and the truths and the good things that we have in Jesus Christ. Take advantage of that precious time that you have with your little ones. A godly mother passes on this legacy in the lives of her little ones. Third, a godly mother's legacy can influence and impact many people. So it's not just our kids that are impacted by having a household of faith. It's other people. I mean, just think of it. We are reading and studying and learning, and people have for 2,000 years about the life of Timothy and his faith and his pastoring at the church in Ephesus. That's an amazing thing. Think of that. And, and who's behind that? Who's behind this story? Eunice, Lois. They're behind it. And so the, their son, their grandson, 
made a difference in the lives of people for ages to come, for generations to come. Mom, what you do in these short years that you have will have a rippling effect in the generations that are to come. I've been looking at Ancestry.com. I've been looking at different things there. And, and uh, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. Has anybody ever done the Ancestor stuff? Raise your hand. One nerdy person like me. Let's connect after the service. I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, and uh, it's Ancestry.com. You sign up for a 14-day trial, but they get you in it because the way that they have it all set up, you got to click and you got to find things. And they already got all the information there. They could all give it to you in one batch, but they make you go through these little hoops. And, and they've done a lot of research how to get you, but it's interesting. You find out all these little things. I found out interesting things about my family. And... Uh, Good things and bad things. You know, you find out there was a great, great uncle. I found a little blurb in the paper that he was um, public intoxication. He was fined 10 bucks in the early 1900s. And he's not around anymore, so I can talk about it at his expense. But uh, when I get to heaven, he's probably going to be mad at me. But that's just the reality. I didn't say his name, but you can, you can find all those types of things. And what you do is going to be, even though you won't be remembered, the legacy that you leave will be remembered in the generations that are to come. Back in the 1800s, a researcher did a study of two different families and their lines, their ancestral lines, that the people that came after them. And, and the one family that he looked at was the family of Jonathan Edwards, Puritan preacher of the early 1700s. Him and his wife, Sarah, had 11 kids. Say, God bless Sarah. And, and had 11 kids, and she was a wonderful mother, and they're a Christian family. And this researcher looked then 140 years down his, after following him, what his family looked like. He took another family from the same time, the family of a criminal named Max Jukes. And he looked at his family line for 140 years, and he compared uh, those two. And, and this is what the research came up with. From the life of Jonathan Edwards, there were college presidents, professors, military officers, public servants, authors, doctors, judges, pastors, lawyers, three senators, and a vice president of the United States. And uh, one of my roommates in college was a descendant from Jonathan Edwards. And so uh, he, he's on there too, which is kind of cool. From the Jukes family, um, a lot of people died poor in the poorhouse. A lot of them were criminals. There were murderers. There were drunks. There were prostitutes. Now, I did a little more research on this because I've seen this as a sermon illustration before, and I just wanted to be, make sure that I'm telling you the truth. And so I did a little more research in it. This study has come under criticism, specifically in the 1960s. They, they criticized it for really kind of making the Jukes family side look worse than it was. And so I'll take that criticism. Forget the bad side. Let's focus on the positive. There's a positive impact that Christ has made on the family of Jonathan Edwards. We have a Jonathan Edwards in the first service this morning. He really liked this illustration. We were on point as we were talking, and, and uh, it was cool. So the point is, a mother's legacy can influence and impact many people. So remember that. When the days are long, when the kids get on your nerves when you don't feel like you have enough of you to go around. But it's a high calling to raise a family in the faith. And your family will impact, for the glory of God, we pray, your family will impact other families for the Lord Jesus Christ. So maybe you feel like you failed. And maybe you even don't even like this message because you feel a little discouraged after hearing this because this is a high, high calling. There's lots of things happening here. And, um, and so if you've examined yourself and you kind of feel um, like you failed to measure up, and let me just encourage you as we close this message, okay? Uh, there's such a thing called pattern formatting. What that is is that all of us, all of people, we take a mental image of ourselves, and it, it formats the way, it's a pattern of the way that we think about ourselves. There was a study done on men and women about uh, men and women taking a mental image of themselves. And this is admittedly about more the physical appearance, but I think it also reflects on, on more than that. It reflects on how critical you are about yourself. On average, 
a man will take a mental image of himself 151 times a month. That's what the average man takes. The average woman takes a mental snapshot image of herself, you ready, 1,360 times a month. That's what the research, that's what the TikTok video said. So that's, that's, uh, <laughs> no, it was this doctor, it was a scientist that was saying it. It happened to be on TikTok, but it was a scientist that was saying it. And uh, so even if that number's not true, because I did the math on it, it's like 1,500 times uh, an hour a woman taking a mental image. I don't know if that's possible. But here's a big point, I think, which is true, is that women can tend to be more critical on themselves than guys and men. And so maybe you're feeling discouraged today, and I hear you, but I just want you to know you're exactly in the place that God wants you to be. And God's given you exactly what you need to pass on a legacy of faith to your kids. You don't need to be a scholar. You don't need to be perfect. God saved you before um, you have got good at all. He chose you. Think of this. He chose you to be saved and to have the position that you have now, whether single, married, kids, no kids. He chose you before he created the world. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. You are not a mistake, Psalm 139, 15 and 18. He brought you forth Specifically, he knew the day that you were going to be born. He brought you forth on that day, Psalm 71, verse 6. He has thoughts towards you that are countless. As much as the sand on the shore of the sea, Psalm 139, 17 and 18. So that means you are truly and deeply loved by God, so much so that Jesus died and rose again for you to purchase your salvation. So this God of heaven and earth, this God who created you, will be faithful to give you the necessary tools and strength to get through each day as you seek to bring the legacy of faith to the next generation. And that's what we're here as a church, to all help each other to do that and to hopefully have an impact on the world for the sake of the gospel of Christ.